All right, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today. Um, I'm Chris Hines, Product Marketing Manager here at the company, and today we'll be discussing Docker for Windows and containers. All right, so I'm joined here with Michael Fries and Elton Stoneman. So thank you both, Michael for Elton and Elton, for being here. Before we kick things off today, what I want to do is remind you that this presentation is being recorded. So what we'll do is we'll follow up with you later this week with a recording of the presentation so you can give it another watch or share it with anyone that you would like. And towards the end of this presentation, we'll make sure to save some time for some Q&A. So you can ask us questions throughout the presentation um, by just um, inputting questions to the chat or the Q&A portal, and we will try to get to as many as we can at the end. And uh, Mike, I guess with that being said, feel free to take it away. And Mike, I think you might still be on mute. <laughs> okay, how's the, how's the audio now? Um, maybe a little bit higher, and then I think we'd be fine. I'm dialed in. Can you can you uh, make the uh, dial-in audio? Yep. No, we're good now. Go ahead. Kick it in. Do you want to keep going with uh, my laptop audio? Uh, no, go ahead. All you. Okay. okay. You can use your great. laptop audio. Yep. All right. Um, great. Thanks, Christopher. Um, so, um, yeah. So, what I'll, what I'll cover today is um, just kind of um, one of the one of the things that we're doing with Microsoft, uh, namely uh, Docker for Windows, which is our kind of um, developer desktop tool for for Windows developers. Then I'll also uh, cover um, Docker Windows Containers, uh, which is what we launched with Microsoft in October uh, with the launch of Windows Server 2016, where you can now run uh, Docker containers natively on Windows. That is running Windows, EXEs, and, and such inside of, um, inside of uh, Docker containers. Um, so I'll go through, uh, go through some of the uh, technical details, and then I'll, I'll do a demo at the end, and then I'll turn it over to, to Elton. Um, so, Docker on Windows Server 2016 came about uh, through a partnership that Docker and Microsoft formed in 2014. And so what the, what that, there was a bunch of stuff in that partnership, but then one of the main things was that Microsoft was going to go add containerization primitives to the Windows kernel. Um, and then together, um, Microsoft and Docker would port the Docker engine, the open source Docker engine to, uh, to Windows. And then on the side, Docker has also been working on porting all the tools and services that we run uh, to, to work with, uh, with Windows uh, container images also, so that stuff like Docker Hub and so on uh, can store, can store uh, um, uh, Windows container images. Um, and so in October 2016, that all kind of came to fruition. Um, Microsoft announced uh, Windows Server 2016. And with it, a uh, um, Docker engine running on Windows Server, uh, starting and stopping and managing uh, containers. Um, yeah, and also actually, um, those containerization enhancements to the Windows kernel are, are also available in in Windows 10 with uh, the Windows 10 Anniversary Edition. So you can run uh, Windows containers directly on on Windows 10, which is uh, great for uh, for development. Um, so the slide just kind of gives an overview of what we're trying to do with uh, with Docker um, uh, on Windows. Um, we're building a full build, ship, run pipeline so that developers can build apps, you can ship them to QA, testing, so on, and then ops can, can run those containerized apps in production. And this, um, thanks to the partnership with Microsoft, we can now offer that both for Linux, uh, which we've done for a couple of years, but also for Windows. So if you're a, if you're a big enterprise or for whatever reason you, you run heterogeneous workloads in both Windows and Linux, uh, Docker is kind of one platform that you can use to manage both, uh, both uh, Windows and Linux stuff, stuff. It's the same tools, it's the same APIs, it's the same image formats, um, all of that is the same between Windows and Linux. And kind of for, for Windows specifically, we're working with Microsoft so that um, developers in Visual Studio um, have really great tools for building um, Docker containers on their on their um, 
uh, development workstations. Um, those containers can be shipped to Docker Hub or to um, a, a private registry um, and can then de be deployed um, either on-prem or in the cloud on both uh, uh, Linux systems or, or, or Windows systems uh, using, using the Docker platform. Uh, so that Docker is kind of pretty unique, uh, in a pretty unique position because we can do that um, both for, for Windows, and, Windows and Linux, we can do it on-prem and in the cloud um, with, uh, in conjunction with, uh, with Microsoft. So kind of getting into the technical details, um, um, so if you know how Docker works on Linux, um, you probably know that when you're building a container image, you can kind of start from scratch, which gets you a completely empty Linux user land. Um, but most people typically start from like a, a common Linux distro like Debian or Ubuntu or Alpine maybe, um, and then kind of build build their app containers on, on, on top of that. So on Windows, it's a little bit different. Um, you, you can't start from scratch, but you can start from one of two um, base images that Microsoft publishes with. Uh, Windows Server Core, which is uh, basically like a, uh, a full Windows Server user land with all the DLLs and System32 um, um, System and, and all the rest of it that, that you'd expect, um, same as, you, as if you had installed Windows Server 2016 from the, from the installation ISO. Um, so the great thing about starting from Starting your container images from Windows Server Core is that you can you can generally run most uh, uh, Windows Server apps. Uh, you, you can you can build them and, and run them on top of uh, that base image. So IIS runs great. SQL Server, the full .NET framework, um, I don't know Java, Python, all uh, all of those, those things that you'd expect to be able to run on Windows Server uh, also runs inside of a Windows Server Core based container. Uh, the downside to that is that the image is a little bulky. Uh, it's a couple of gigabytes. Um, which turns out to not be a giant problem because you kind of get that base layer once and then the Docker engine is really smart about sharing layers between images. So you really only need that base layer once and then all the, all the containers you build based off of Windows Server Core um, are gonna be based off of that one base layer. So you only have it once in your system. Um, the other option is Nano Server, which is a new variant of uh, Windows Server that Microsoft launched with Windows Server 2016. It's very minimal. Um, uh, the, all of the GUI is, uh, is stripped out, so it's only a couple hundred megabytes. Um, so that's really great for building kind of minimal containers. Um, Nano server based containers also start and stop faster, and they're a little easier to move around. Um, the downside is that um, um, can't really, uh, because not the full Windows, um, Windows API is available, um, you're a little bit limited in the apps that you can run. Um, but IIS works, for example, and also at .NET Core works, works in there um, already. And the whole Go, uh, Golang toolchain also works great in, in the server. Uh, so that kind of covers the base image choice. Uh, you also have a choice of isolation. Um, so similar to on Linux where you can lock down running containers with setcom profiles and, and app armor um, and so on, um, on Windows, you have a choice of two, um, two types of isolation. Windows Server containers is very similar to Linux. So basically, um, if you run three Windows Server containers on a, on a Windows host, it's the same as on Linux. They share the, um, the host kernel. They share that uh, between themselves and also between other user land processes running on that Windows system. Um, so that's great. You get like very good density because um, the container processes are just kind of running as normal processes on the system, but in an isolated context with a sandbox file system. So you get very good density and excellent uh, startup performance and so on. Um, the other option is to run with Hyper-V isolation. So with Hyper-V isolation, each container actually runs in inside of a thin hypervisor. Um, so it's a, a minimal Linux kernel, and then the container image is placed inside of that uh, hypervisor with that Windows kernel, and then, then it's, uh, it, uh, it starts running. Um, so that's a little bit slower and the resource overhead um, is, is slightly larger, but um, you get bit isolation potentially because if a container process is compromised by an attacker, the attacker has to escape both through the Windows isolation and out through the, through the, through the hypervisor. Uh, the good thing is that as a developer um, uh, or administrator, you don't have, really have to worry about this isolation. Um, you can build 
the images any which way you want. And then at runtime, they, you can choose, oh, do I want to uh, deploy this image as a Windows Server container or a Hyper-V container, depending on the, on the scenario. Um, so it just gives you a kind of deployment flexibility um, at no cost to, uh, to, to developers or anyone planning how to, how to build, um, build these container images. This, uh, this is just a more detailed diagram showing the same thing. So uh, on the left, you can see the user process is running on a system. Then in the middle, there's a Windows Server container. You can, you can see it's sharing the Windows kernel with uh, all the other stuff uh, running on the system, but running in an isolated context. Uh, and then on the right, there's a Hyper-V container. So you, can, so you get its own Windows kernel, and then the, the container is, um, is executing inside of that uh, hypervisor on top of a minimal um, Windows kernel. So if you're interested in um, <clears throat> getting started with Windows Server containers, um, as I mentioned, if you have Windows 10 and you have the Anniversary Edition update, which came out uh, I don't know, four, four months ago, I think, um, you are actually uh, ready to go. Um, just install Docker for Windows, um, which is available uh, from docker.com, uh, and choose the beta channel. And then, then uh, Docker for Windows will set you up to develop both uh, Linux-based containers and, and Windows-based containers. And I'll demo that in, in a little bit. Um, if for any reason you don't want to do that, you can also just grab the Windows Server 2016 ISO uh, and just install Windows Server 2016 in, in a VM. That's a free, um, it's a free uh, trial. Um, if you pre prefer to use the cloud, um, all of the major cloud providers already have Windows Server 2016 support, so both Azure, AWS, and Google Compute Engine have um, great Windows Server 2016 images. Um, and both Azure and AWS also support uh, Nano Server. If you want to try that out, if you're on Mac or uh, Mac or Linux, um, you can run Windows Server 2016 in a VM. It's uh, pretty easy to set up and use. Um, yeah, and there's a link to a blog post at the bottom where um, I take you through building your first Windows Server container app. Um, yeah, and just to round this out. Um, so the way it works is that on Windows Server 2016, you actually um, you actually get the commercially supported version of, of the Docker engine, um, and that um, that just comes courtesy of your uh, Windows license. Um, so that's the deal that with, that Docker has with Microsoft. Um, so that means that um, if you have access to uh, Microsoft support for Windows and you encounter a problem running Docker on Windows Server, you can just give Microsoft a call and they'll help you figure out what's, the, what's going on with, uh, with Docker on your, on your Windows system. And if they can't figure it out, they can escalate to Docker, and, uh, and then um, we'll, we'll help you solve the problem. Um, so this comes uh, bundled with your purchase of uh, Windows Server 2016. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll do a demo. Um, so as I mentioned, um, let's see. up here. Um, as I mentioned, when you install uh, Docker for Windows, the beta version will, will set up both uh, Linux and Windows container development. So this is Docker for Windows running down here on the right uh, in my system tray. So there's a switch between uh, uh, li uh, Linux and Windows containers. So if I do a Docker version right now, uh, you'll see that I'm building a Linux containers. So I can just switch to Windows containers. Uh, and I can do Docker version. Uh, and now I'm uh, building uh, containers for Windows. Uh, so yeah, you can just uh, switch back and forth depending on, on what kind of stuff you're doing right now. And when you're doing um, uh, Windows container development, it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's all, all the same, um, it's all the same command. So Docker images, I can go look at the images I have here. Um, so I have uh, Windows Server Core and Nano Server, which are the, the base images. Um, and because I'm using Dark for Windows, this is actually running the, those containers directly on, on Windows 10. Um, so let's get a container going. So do Docker run dash ti. Just start a Nano Server container. I'll start PowerShell. Oh, you spelled Microsoft wrong. Okay. Yep. Let's see. 
Um, so containers start a little bit slower on Windows that they, than they do on Linux. Um, but here I am inside of a uh, nano server container. Um, and you can see if I do dir, um, I have a uh, clean, uh, clean Windows system um, with, uh, with nano server. And so the neat thing is, like this comes with all the, the same um, kind of isolation semantics uh, as, as on uh, Windows. So for example, if I write a file, Um, if I write a file on this inside of this container, what's it complaining about? All right. So now I have a test file here. Oh, I did it wrong. Um, then I, I just opened another shell, so I'm going to run an, another nano server, uh, a nano, another nano server container on this system. Um, wait, that's the root startup. Um, and then I can do dir here, and there's no test file. Um, uh, so the, the isolation semantics are the same, and if I, this processes, I only see the processes that are inherent to this container and so on. Um, and I can do all the normal kind of Docker administrative commands, so I can do docker ps to list these two containers that are now running. I can do docker exec and, and all the rest of it. It works, it works great. Um, yeah, so that's running very simple um, uh, Windows containers. Um, so next up, I want to show a more uh, complicated example. Um, and for this, um, so you can you can um, you can you can do Windows container development uh, directly on Windows 10, as I mentioned. So actually, if you do it a lot, I found that having a real Windows Server 2016 system is, is a little bit easier and it's a little bit faster. Um, so uh, this IP is basically a, a, a dev machine that I have uh, in the office uh, that I just point my my, doc, uh, my Docker um, um, CLI at, and then I can I can run um, containers on that. Um, so I'm going to do that for this uh, kind of like more compli complicated example. So the app I'm going to show running um, just to um, uh, show you that um, the implementation is complete on Windows is it's a music store app which is the ASP.NET team's um, kind of default uh, multi-tier app. So it's um, ASP.NET front, uh, web front-end with a SQL Server uh, database backend, so it's a two-tier app. Um, and I have it, uh, I have the um, uh, code open here in the uh, Visual Studio code. Um, so I just took the source code and then I started dockerizing it and the process is exactly the same on Windows as it is on Linux. So the first thing I did was to create a Docker file. I call it dockerfile.windows, uh, but you can call it dockerfile if you want. And as you can see, the, the instructions on Windows are the same as on Linux. So that's a from command where I start from uh, Microsoft slash uh, .NET. So that's a base image based on Windows that Microsoft maintains that, um, that already has .NET uh, installed. Microsoft maintains a bunch of, uh, of different base images um, for IIS, SQL Server, and a bunch of other stuff. And those are all available on Docker Stall and on Docker Hub. Then I set up the shell. Um, so it's kind of funny. On, on Windows, the default shell is cmd.exe, which is not a great experience, but we added this instruction. Um, it works for both on Linux and Windows, so that you can set up the shell for the rest of the commands in this Docker file. So all the rest of the commands in this Docker file are going to be run with PowerShell. Then I uh, set a registry setting to work around a bug that's currently in Windows. I think it is actually fixed now. Uh, well, I'll just leave it in to be safe. Um, then I create a deck directory to work in uh, with my source code. Um, I use that directory. Then I copy. So if you're familiar with um, .NET Core. Um, I copy in the project.json and the nuget.config. That's basically the two files in my source code that specify the uh, packages that are needed for this app. Um, so project.json will list all the nuget packages that I need. So I copy those two files in, and then I can run .NET, .NET restore, which fetches those um, nuget packages into the container. So that's sim similar to like npm, um, npm or doing bundle um, bundler with uh, Ruby. Then I add in the rest of the source code, and then I can run .NET build. Um, 
Then finally, I tell Docker that this app will be listening on port 5000, um, and then I can do .NET run. Um, so I can go back to my console, and I can do Docker build, ht, oops, Docker build up Windows. Um, and then uh, Docker will build uh, build this app. Um, so yeah, exactly the same as on as on Linux. Um, now this gets me to building kind of single containers. But similar to on Linux, you want you for more complex apps, you want to run multiple containers. So uh, Docker Compose uh, works fine on Windows also. So for this app, I need two containers running to test it. I need a database, um, which is going to be SQL Server. So again, I'm just using a default base image that's published by Microsoft uh, for SQL Server. And then I need a web, the, the web container, which is basically the web app that I just showed you. Um, so I just built the Docker file that I just, uh, that we just looked at. Um, and that, that's pretty much it. Um, so I already pre-built this app, so I can do um, Docker Compose. Up. Um, and then Docker will go start the database and then the web container. Um, and it should all be coming up. Uh, and I can go look at this app in my browser. And it's going to be on 192, 168. Yeah. I think it's actually going to be this IP. Uh, let's wait for that app to come up. Um, yeah. Um, and you can see. Uh, as I mentioned, all the all the normal commands work. Docker PS. Um, I can also actually uh, connect to the database. Um, here, here the app is running now. Um, so it's just a simple CRUD app. Um, uh, I can also connect to the database um, uh, with uh, SQL Server Management Studio. So SQL Server Management Studio is running on my Windows 10 host. Um, but I can go look at the database uh, in, that's running inside of the inside of the Docker container, and the tables were created. Um, so that's all good. Um, so just to give you an idea of what Dockerizing um, Windows apps with uh, with uh, Windows containers look like looks like, um, and really like a really neat thing is is the SQL Server part. So if any of you watching this have seen or have have done SQL Server administration before, like, you know, it's, it's fairly laborious to set up and install SQL Server, um, and it's like a big, unwieldy piece of software. Um, so, but just to give you an idea of the power of uh, containers, um, I'm going to spin up a couple of couple more uh, SQL Server containers, and you can see they start, they start in a, like a second or two. And each time I do, this, I, I do this, I get a completely new, fresh uh, SQL Server instance running in a container in an isolated context with a sandbox file system. Um, so I can do .ps, and you can see I now have three SQL Server containers running um, running in this system, and it's not it's not breaking a sweat. Um, uh, and like I could give one of these to my coworkers; they could log into it and blow it up, and it will not affect either the host or any of the other. SQL Server containers running on that system. So it's really great for isolating um, kind of CI test systems or, and also for running uh, in production with, uh, with isolation um, and good density because it's, it's very easy to run a bunch of um, uh, containers side by side without a lot of uh, resource overhead. Um, yeah, um, that's, uh, that's all I have for the demo, I think. Um, yeah, so just to recap, I showed running a couple of small uh, nano server containers side by side and just showing that like writing to the file system of one doesn't, uh, uh, that those files just show up in that, in that container and not on the host nor, nor on any other containers running on that system. And then I showed uh, how you'd go about um, dockerizing a real world uh, kind of multi tier .NET app composed of a, .NET-based uh, web front end and a, and a SQL Server 
um, a database backend. Um, the Docker file to build the web, uh, the .NET web app, and the Compose file to uh, to, um, to run those two in concert. Um, and then the ease with which you can run a bunch of containers side by side without a lot of resource overhead, and even for big complex apps like uh, Microsoft SQL Server. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, round out the presentation and, and hand it over to um, to Elton. Um, so, um, Docker containers on Windows is, is a very important part of uh, the partnership that Docker and Microsoft have. Uh, but we're also doing a bunch of other stuff. Um, so, uh, for example, we work with the .NET, the .NET team, both the .NET Core guys, but also the full .NET team. Um, and they're publishing great um, uh, base images on Docker Hub and on Docker Store, both for Linux and for Windows, actually. So. If you're interested in the brave new world of .NET development on Linux, um, there's great, um, there's great uh, base layers for you to, to get started from on, on uh, Docker Hub. Um, we're working with the SQL Server guys. Um, they have uh, good, they actually also have both uh, a base image for both Linux and Windows for SQL Server. SQL Server now runs on Linux, and one of the ways you can do that is to run it inside of a Linux Docker container. And they have both the SQL Server 2014 and 2016 uh, Windows base images. Then we also do a lot of work with the Visual Studio guys. Um, there's great tooling coming out in Visual Studio 2016. If you tried the RT, you'll, you'll have seen this already. Uh, and also for Visual Studio Code. Um, and then we work with the Azure team to make sure that uh, Docker is a great experience on Azure. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so. Um, that's uh, that's it. Um, okay. Um, I think Elton, if it would be easier for me to just, I'll pass you the ball and you can share your screen because I know there's something you want to demo as well. So let me pass the ball over to Elton at this point. Thanks, Mike. So Elton, you have the ball and you can share whenever you'd like. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mike. That was a great walkthrough. Um, so like Mike said, we're doing a lot of stuff with, with Windows. We've um, The partnership with Microsoft has put uh, the, the stuff that makes Docker work, which has been in Linux for a long time, put that right into Windows. Um, so we can we can start reutilizing um, Docker containers in Windows and getting all the benefits that the Linux guys have had for a while. When we do presentations like the one that Mike's just done, and when we're out at conferences talking to people, uh, the, the next thing they say is, where do I start? Um, and often uh, the, the answer is, you know, we've got some great uh, tutorials, we've got some great labs on GitHub that you can follow along with uh, and, and start understanding how Docker works and how the platform benefits you. Um, but, but often people have got a whole bunch of stuff already, and they want to see, how can I take this and put it into containers? So we, br we brought out this open source tool. Uh, a few weeks ago called image to docker which is a, which is a powershell module and what you do with image to docker is you, you point it at, um, at the, the, the virtual hard disk file for a virtual machine and it extracts the stuff that you've got installed into docker files so the the, the docker file that we saw mike had there that started from a windows server image and installed all his software this tool builds that for you so you, so it, it compiles your Docker file, and then you can build that into an image and, and go straight from your VM to, uh, to, a, to a Docker container. But we'll have a look at that in, in just a second. It, it's artifact-based tool. So what it does is it, uh, it uses PowerShell to inspect the software that's installed on the, on the virtual hard disk. And it does things like work out what Windows features are installed. And then there are certain artifacts that it understands better than others. So it can tell you that MSMQ is installed, and it will generate a Docker file that, that adds the MSMQ Windows feature. Uh, but at the moment, the, the, the most fully featured one that it understands is IIS. So you can point it to a, a virtual hard disk file, tell it to extract IIS, and it can navigate through all the websites that are installed, uh, and it understands that some are ASP.NET, and it can pull out a, a Docker file to, to to run your Windows web app um, in, a, in a Docker container. 
And that's not just ASP.NET Core, we're talking about classic ASP.NET apps too there. So when you're just starting to get to, to think about what you can do with Docker, um, it gets you up and running really quickly. So we'll have a quick demo now with some, with some uh, uh, really simple basic apps that are on a virtual hard disk and we'll pull them out into Docker. And from then on, you can iterate over that. And so you've got your start of a 10 Docker file. Um, it shows you what's, what's already in your VHD. And then you can start um, iterating and, and getting the, the benefit that you would expect once you move on to a container platform. Okay, so let's move on to the demo. Okay, so this is a um, this is a Windows 2016 server. This is the VM running in Azure, uh, and the, the the image to Docker tool is a PowerShell module. So to start off with, I'm going to install that module. Uh, it's up on PowerShell Gallery. So to install it, you just do install module image to Docker. At the end of this session, we'll have a, a whole list of, uh, of follow-on resources, and there's one, with, there's a blog post that, that tells you how to do pretty much what I'm going to show you now. So once you've installed it, you do import module and image to Docker to make it available in this session. And there's one key command that we've got, which is called uh, convert to Docker file. So it's got all the help text that you would expect. Convert to Docker file. Uh, and he just told you, give me a, give me a valid uh, Windows image file or a valid virtual hard disk, and I will give you a Docker file at the end. And we've got the, all the detailed help stuff there that you would expect with a whole bunch of samples of what you need to do um, to take your own, your own VHD and, uh, and point it, to, uh, point it to, to, a, to a Docker file at the output. So on my, uh, on my VM here, I've copied the virtual hard disk from another VM, which is just my, my 13 gigabyte VHD file. So that's a, that's, a, that's a virtual machine with IIS installed and half a dozen different types of websites. I'm going to use image to Docker to pull some Docker images out from that VHD. Okay, so firstly what we do is we run convert to Docker file and we tell it where the image is. And so that's just my VHD file or VHDX or a WIM file. So at the moment we're only using Hyper-V formats, um, but if you've got a VirtualBox image or a VMware image, um, you can use either Microsoft's tools or VirtualBox's tools to convert them to VHD. And then our, our tool works from that. So I've got my, I, I call this tool I2D2, but um, no one else has picked up on that yet. So it's just me who calls it that. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so the image path, that's where do I find the image. The output path, where shall I put my artifacts to build the Docker image? And we'll put them in a similar place. And I can let it run, and it will run on all the artifacts that it understands. So it'll spit me out a Docker file with all the, um, all the Windows features that it's got in there and um, everything else that it, can, that it can work with. So it doesn't take a huge amount of time, but because I know this is a web server, I will just stick to IIS. Okay, and I'll make it verbose so we can see what's going on. So what this tool does, um, it looks inside the virtual hard disk file, it mounts it as a, as a, a mount inside, inside the, uh, the file system. It doesn't run the virtual machine, so it's offline, so you can copy your VHD file and leave your, your um, VM running intact. As it goes through, it, uh, it tells you what it's up to. So in this case, it says it's looking for IS, it's found IS, and then we get a whole bunch of stuff telling us that it's, it's um, uh, writing out the instructions to create the, 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 the websites. So in this case, we've got um, a whole bunch of different websites on there, and it's found them all. So I've got Nerd Dinner, which is part of a different uh, project that we're running um, to convert a very old application. We've got an ASP.NET MVC site, Web API, and a few other bits and pieces. So that's, that's the kind of first pass of taking the entire VM, the entire web server, uh, and putting it into a Docker file. So I've got code open here. And it's, this is the output from the tool. So this folder here, I've got my Docker file, which looks very similar to the one that Mike showed us earlier. And um, there's a few more bits and pieces going in here, but the tool has got a template in there to make it to make a, a Windows-friendly Docker file. So like Mike said, we're using PowerShell. Uh, the template does that for us. And um, we're using Microsoft's Windows Server core base image. So that Server core base image will run full .NET framework. Um, it can, you can install MSI as part of your Docker file if you've got a, if you've got a, a dependency that you need for that. Um, you can basically do everything that you can do on Windows Server 2016 inside this container. So the, um, the tool here generates a, whole, uh, a, few, a few different sections. So this section here is installing the Windows features. So that's IIS. 
and ASP.NET because it found we had an ASP.NET site on there. So it's, uh, it's installing that into the, into the Docker file too. It goes through all the optional features that, uh, that are installed on IIS and it will by default include them all in the Docker file, which is uh, potentially you've got something non-standard installed. So we have to make sure that that's in the Docker file too to make sure your applications work. But this is a good excuse to have a look through and say, do I really need all this stuff? Do I need directory browsing and health and diagnostics? And you can clean up your, your, um, your new web server, which will run in a container and make it neater than your existing VM, which is maybe uh, has had a few um, manual tweaks since it's been running in production. And then after that, there's a section for each website that, that the tool found in IIS. So there's Nerd Dinner, and here's my basic ASP.NET MVC site. And they're, they're the same. They copy in the, um, the files for the website, which the tool pulls out of the VHD. It copies the, and then the Docker file will copy it into the, the image, the container image. Then we run a PowerShell uh, commandlet to set up the new website in IIS. We can point it to where the website content is in the image because we know where it is because we've just copied it in. Uh, and the tool can extract the port that the, the website is currently set up to run in IIS, and uh, it exposes that in, in the Docker file. So that's fine. So we've run that over our VHD. This is a, this is a VM running you know, half a dozen websites, and it will produce a Docker file, which we could run, and we'd have a container that had half a dozen websites running. And this bit at the end here is how the container starts. So when the container starts up, uh, it's going to run a PowerShell script to start the, web, the W3 service, the IIS service, uh, and monitor it to make sure it's OK. And then if the, if the web service falls over for any reason, uh, the container will report back to Docker, and then Docker can restart it and keep, keep your website up and running. So that's a, a reasonably good start, but that's not how you would build a Docker image uh, if you were starting from scratch, because the, the best way to, to, to make the best use of Docker is to have one application running uh, per container. And that way you can upgrade them independently, you can scale them independently, you can move them to different places. And the tool supports that too. So if I close this folder down and go back to PowerShell. So my previous, my previous command to convert to Dockerfile, I told it I wanted to look at IIS. And the tool also supports artifact parameters. So I can say, uh, actually, I only want you to pull out the ASP.NET web forms website. So that's the name of the website in IIS. So I'm saying go to IIS, only pull out that particular website, run the tool. Oh, I need to give it a new output directory because by default it won't overwrite one that's already there, which is friendly. Web forms. Okay, it's going to do exactly the same thing. So it mounts the, the VHD and then it inspects the image and it will tell me what it's found as it goes through. So this can be a bit less out this time so we can see it a bit better. So it says, uh, it knows it's a VHD. Uh, it says it started to discover IIS. So it's going through all the, all the, um, the PowerShell entries in the, in the code base to find out what, what's installed with IIS, what features are in there. Uh, and then it will spit out a, um, uh, a Docker file at the end. So the target image, it knows what version of Windows we've got. Uh, and it knows, what have we got here? It found IIS, it found ASP.NET, and then I only told, told it to, to extract the details for this particular website, ASP.NET Web Forms, and that's what it's done. And then it dismounts the image, and then you can move off the disk if you need to. So back in code, I've got a new folder now for my ASP.NET Web Forms app, uh, and that's got a Docker file, which starts in exactly the same way uh, because it uses the same template. It's going to install the same features because I went to the VHD for it, uh, but it's only going to create one website now. So this Docker image, when I build it, will only run my ASP.NET Web Forms app. Uh, it's not going to run all the other things because they've been left behind in the, v in the VHD. So this is more like it. So when I can run this now, I will have one web application running in my container. And then if this is a, a, a small scale container, I might only have a couple of instances. And my other applications, I can scale up much higher if, they've got a, if, they, if they need more scale. So now I've got my I2D2 ASP.NET Web Forms image. Let's go in here. Okay. So this is my this is the output from the tool. So that JSON file is just a, a record of what it did. So we can go and check and see if it uh, if it needs any debugging. The ASP Net Web Forms is the output is the is the whole content of the website which it pulled from the VHD and is ready to put into the Docker image. And uh, the config it takes the IS config too. So to build that into an image, just Docker build. Give the image a name, so I2D2 
There's pnet web forms and tell it where to look, which is just a local directory. Okay, and that does a whole bunch of stuff. So that was really quick because I've already built a similar image on this virtual machine before. The reason it's quick is because all these things come from Docker's cache. So when you build an image, a Docker image that contains your whole application stack, um, actually it's layered and Docker intelligently reuses those layers. So any, any other um, images that I use, which, have, which are based on IIS and ASP.NET, will come from the cache. So they'll share that base image. So that kind of nine gigabyte image that's got Windows on it and IIS on it uh, will be shared among many containers. Okay, so then it's copied in my website. It's exposed the port. So, so by default, containers are locked down. You can't send traffic into them. You have to explicitly expose ports to let them receive traffic from the outside. Uh, and then they're setting up the command, telling you what to do when we start a container. And that's containers ready to run. So I'll clear and I will do Docker. Docker run dash D. So dash D puts in the background. So it's going to start my web server uh, in a container and leave it running in the background. I need to expose the port so that I can get access to it. I could map it to a different port if I wanted my web server to, to use something other than 8083. Uh, and then give the container a name so I can refer to it. I don't have to do that, but that's going to make my life easier. And then the name of the image, which I just built. So that's ASP.NET Web Forms. Okay, so the, so the Docker image is just my whole packaged application. And what I've got now is a container running from that image. So that's, a, that's a, a live execution of my app. I could run several more containers, but I'd have to use different ports because you can only have one port listening on a host. That great big long ID is the, the container's unique ID, but I can also refer to it by the name. So if I run a Docker top ASP.NET, I should have given it a shorter name, ASP.NET Web Forms. It tells me what processes are running inside the container. So at the moment, I've got a whole bunch of things running, which is just what you get when you start up Windows. Um, that's not part of what I've, what I've instructed the, the image to do. Uh, if I clear and do Docker logs. So the Docker platform understands what containers are doing, so it can interrogate them. So doing top asks it what processes are running and shows you the output. Doing logs will pull out whatever's being written to the console by the, by the application. Uh, which in this case will just be a line telling me that it started listening. So yeah, so the log tells me that the, the little PowerShell script that starts up the IIS web, web uh, Windows service and monitors it to make sure it's still running just outputs that single line to tell me everything's up and running. <coughs> Excuse me. So now I can find the IP address. So we had a question earlier while, while Mike was talking about why we need the IP address of the, uh, of the container. Um, so if you're familiar with Linux containers, when you run the container in the background and publish the port, uh, you can access it as if, as if you were using local host. So I wouldn't need to know the container address. So each container is an isolated environment. Inside the container, the app thinks it's running on its own server. It's got its own IP address. It's got its own host name. But outside the container, you don't normally care about those things. Um, right now, there's a restriction in, in the Windows networking stack which stops us using local host, which is why when you start up a Windows container, if you want to access it from the host where it's running, you need the container's IP address. From outside this machine, you can get to it from the machine's host name. So now, with that IP address, I should be able to go and see my SP.NET application running. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's going to call into the container, which is running IIS, which is running my ASP.NET Web Forms app, and it's just the standard template that you get with Visual Studio. Create a new Web Forms app, and this is what you get. So it's it's actually running ASP ASPX pages that are, that are being um, that are being generating the content, and actually we can see that if we look at the code the code behind from the, the, the website that we pulled out of the VHD. So that's my web application running in a container in Docker. Very nice. But that's only one of them. So there are more on that VHD, so we should pull those out too. So very similar process. Uh, I'm going to grab the ASP.NET MVC site that I know is on that machine and put that in a different place. 
and it'll do this exactly the same process that we've seen before. So it's going to read the VHD, uh, mount the VHD, read through the contents, uh, find those IIS, find those ASP.NET, uh, and then pull out a Docker file for me, uh, which will do just that single website, a different website this time, which is ASP.NET MVC. And same thing, it's just the template app that you get from Visual Studio, um, which I've bundled into it into my virtual machine. Okay, and that's that's done. It's dismounted the image, and now I'm going to have an ASP.NET MVC site uh, generated for me in my in my IDD2, MID2 directory. So there we are, and it looks exactly the same, pretty much, because it starts from the same template, it adds the same IIS and ASP.NET features, and then it copies in my MVC website. So different content this time, but same process. So this is, when I build this into an image, it's gonna be uh, an image that's based off exactly the same set of base layers, the Windows layer, the ISP.NET layer, but then it's gonna add on a new layer for this specific website, which is gonna be listening on 8081 this time. And that ASP.NET site um, has got all the content that you get from a basic ASP.NET site. So we're using um, Razor and CSHTML and all that sort of stuff instead of ASPX. Okay, so same process. I'll go into my ASP.NET MVC site uh, and those are all the bits and pieces. And I'll build that Docker file into an image. Go build dash T, ITD2 ASP.NET MVC. Uh, and dot. So once these are built, I could push these up to Docker Hub, and anyone with a with Windows running Docker can, can run these apps if they particularly want to. So um, these can be shared uh, on the Docker Hub, which is the, the public site where you can go and um, download images that have got open source software on them. It's where Microsoft hosts their base images, so you can grab them, and anyone can grab those. Um, and that's the thing that's been that's been kind of. Uh, proliferating the, the usage of Docker. So I think we've had about 8 billion pulls, 8 billion downloads of images from Docker Hub since it started a few years ago. Okay, so that's my second Docker image built. And I can run that as well. So Docker run, same again, put it in the background, expose the port 8081 so I can actually send traffic into the container, uh, give it a name, I'll just call it MVC this time. And it was ITD2, ASP.NET MVC, and that will run. It will give me a, a great big long ID as well for the um, for the the container ID. Okay, cool. So if I see the processes are running now, I've got two applications running: uh, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Web Forms. Uh, they both got random container IDs, and it tells me uh, what, what's going on with them. I can do the same process before and look at the logs for my MVC site. Um, that's told me that the W3 service is running. Great. So I've got two web servers running in containers. If I do get process on the host, so this is it's my virtual machine that's running Docker, and look for W3 WP. So I've got I've only got one worker process running because the second website hasn't had any traffic yet. So if I inspect that website and send some traffic in, okay, so that's got a different virtual IP address so that's allocated by the Docker platform. It uses its own range of addresses and it's got a, a, a NAT network between the host and the, the containers. So the host can get to containers and containers can get to each other all within that same virtual network. So back to my browser, good old IE and 8081 was the port. Okay, so once the traffic goes in, uh, then uh, a worker process will start inside the, the container and we should be able to get some traffic coming. We should see the result of my ASP.NET website, my MVC website this time. And then we'll see how the processes are, how the processes are looking on the host as well. Okay, so that's my ASP.NET MVC website. It's the same getting started template that we had from, from web forms, but this one happens to be running with, uh, with the MVC framework instead of the, the ASPX framework. Now, back in the host, if I look at the processes now, I've got two worker processes running on the host. So because, as, as Mike was saying, because we have a shared kernel, so we've got effectively one instance of Windows running, my Windows server, and then the containers are using the same um, process host for, for running their own processes. So those W3 processes are the IS servers that are running inside the container, but we can see them on the host because it's actually the host that's starting them. They are isolated from each other, so there's like a thin boundary around them. Uh, so they can't get to each other, but we can see them from the host. This VM doesn't have IS installed. 
So I don't need to have any of the, uh, the prerequisites for the applications in Docker on my Docker host. This is a vanilla VM with no extra features. Uh, all I've done is install Docker. Everything that the application needs is bundled up inside the, uh, the Docker image, uh, starting from the, a known base point, which is Windows Server Core. So that's my, uh, th those are my two apps running. And I want to leave us some time for Q&A at the end, so I'll have a quick look at this. So these are the images that I've built and the ones I've tried out earlier. So those are my two from today, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Web Forms, built about an hour ago. And they are 10 gigabytes each. So if you're looking at it, you're thinking, well, I could, I could push those up to the hub, uh, but that's going to push two lots of 10 gigabytes up, and that's going to take forever, and it's going to take forever to download. But actually, that's not the way Docker works. So because these guys are based off Microsoft Windows Server Core, which is the base image, that's where the bulk of that size is. These are virtual sizes of the image. So of that 9.9 .9 gigabytes for my uh, ASP.NET MVC uh, container image, 9.2 of that is Windows Server Core. So anyone who's got Windows Server Core can pull my image from the hub, and they'd only be downloading 700 meg. And of that 700 meg, most of that is installing IIS and ASP.NET. So the difference between my MVC and my web forms, um, <coughs> excuse me, containers, is probably only about 50 meg. So if I've already got my ASP MVC website container image downloaded from the hub, and I wanted to pull the web forms image, it's probably only going to download another 10 or 20 meg because of the way that Docker is layered and because of the way the layers are shared and reused. So if I took my original VM and I wanted to take all those websites out and isolate them in other VMs, I'd be talking about five lots of you know, 50 gig or even 100 gig for a Windows VM to be on the safe side. To share them and get isolation like this with, with Docker, I'd have five Docker images. They'd all be using the same base images. So I'd end up in total with about 10 and a half gig because of the way that the image layers are reused and they're cached on the engine. Okay, so that's, uh, that's about it for image to Docker. So we've got a, that tool is uh, an open source tool. Uh, you can go and grab it from PowerShell Gallery just to in install module like I did. It's up on GitHub, so you can go and poke around in the code um, and feel free to contribute. We've had some great contributions already. And there are some issues there of what we want to do going forward uh, and, and a roadmap for where we'd like to take this tool. Um, and yeah, and that's, that's a great way to get started because from here, I've got my existing application running in Docker. I could leave it at that, and it's, I've already got a huge amount of benefit over running it in a VM. Uh, but if I want to, I can now start looking at, at breaking that application down. So if my MVC application was a, was a big old monolith, uh, and I wanted to take key high value parts of it out, I've got a platform to do that now. Because it's running on Docker, I could take a piece out and put that in its own image and have those containers talking to each other uh, in the virtual network inside Docker. And so I've got a route to, to modernizing my old application. Okay, so. okay, so back to the slides. Um, as, as Mike said, we'll share all this, and I think you'll be able to download this and, and uh, the, the whole presentation and watch it again. We've got a whole bunch of resources. So we've got a lot of stuff out in the community. Um, we've got our labs up on GitHub. We've got a lot of resources on our blog, uh, which are getting updated all the time. Windows Server 2016 has got a, a, a free trial license that you can use. And if you're running on Windows 10, you can use Docker for Windows instead. Um, there's, some, there's some links there to what other people are doing with Windows, uh, which is some, some interesting stuff happening. Um, and the, the, I suppose the key takeaways are that you can, get, you can run your existing workflows in Windows on Docker. Um, and then that's your platform to, to kind of move forward. OK. Also, thank you so much, Elton. Thank you so much, Mike, for both your demos and for taking us through those slides. Um, we have a few extra minutes here for questions. I know Elton and Mike have been doing a good job of answering questions as they've come in. There are a few out here that I, that I do want to call attention to because um, I'm not sure that everyone in the audience has got a chance to look at that Q&A stream. Um, one of the questions that came in was around um, orchestration. Um, so one of the questions was, uh, what is the best way to orchestrate containers on Windows Server 2016? So, uh, Mike, I know you provided a response there. Do you mind kind of walking through that response and um, talking about kind of what Swarm can do there in terms of orchestration? Yeah, so right now we're working. Um, so, so basically, you can actually, if you want, you can grab a, um, you can get the kind of the pre-Docker 112 Swarm mode working with, uh, with Windows hosts. 
um, if you just want to experiment with that. The other thing you can do is you can run a Linux master, and then you can have a Windows worker join uh, join the Linux master, and you can also start experimenting that way. Um, to have full swarm mode working uh, just with a set of Windows nodes, there's a few networking enhancements that we need uh, in Windows. Um, so support for that has already been merged into Docker 113, actually, which will be out shortly. Um, uh, but then, in addition to those enhancements in Docker 113, uh, we also need a few um, a few changes in in Windows. So we're we're waiting uh, and we're working with Microsoft to uh, to get those into the into the next update to uh, to Windows. And then 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 you'll kind of get the full glorious uh, uh, Docker Swarm experience on on Windows with overlay networking and being able to spin up containers. Um, and create services, and uh, those containers can communicate and um, through overlay networking, even even though they're running on different uh, on different hosts. Um, and we're also working on so. In addition to that, we're working on getting a Docker data center. Um, um, we we're already running proofs con proof of concepts of that. Um, so if you want more than just kind of the bare bones uh, Docker swarm. Um, Docker also has Docker Data Center, which is a kind of full management, user management and app management um, uh, framework that you can install on top of um, uh, the Docker platform, and that gets you, uh, yeah, user management that ties into Active Directory or where else your, your user information lives, um, and you can manage apps, you get a graphical GUI, um, all, all that good stuff. Christopher, are there uh, other questions that, that you'd like to highlight? Uh, yes, sorry, I was on mute actually. I see that, I believe Elton was just about to answer a question that came in around the image size. So uh, is the server core image expected to be smaller in the future? And um, yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. I was just about to answer actually, but it is better to call it out. So, so the server core image uh, is big and it's probably gonna stay big. So the idea of Server Core is that it, 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 you can run any workload that you can run on Windows Server 2016 on, on Server Core uh, in a container. So it, it's unlikely to be slimmed down. One of the reasons why it's so big is because all those features that we, that we saw um, being installed in the Docker file are actually part of the, of the base image already. So you, there is no, unlike with Linux, where you would say, I need these components as part of the Docker file, I'll download them or I'll use app get or whatever to install them. Um, Windows Server 2016, the, the core image has all those things there. So you just, you just enable them as you're, going through, uh, as you're going through your Docker file. So it's unlikely to get smaller. Um, the nano server image will probably get smaller because they're, they're really working on, on um, on bringing that down. So, so the, the question is, you know, at some point in the future, we'll have uh, hopefully a smaller nano server image. Server core probably won't get seismically smaller. It'll probably be trimmed. Um, but what Microsoft are doing is that they do regular updates of those images to include all the latest OS patches. So, so your operating system patch story for containers is totally different to what it is for, for VMs. Um, so, so if I've got my nine gigabyte Windows Server core image um, and Microsoft push out a new version with a whole bunch of hot fixes, what I do is I just uh, rebuild my Docker file and that will pull down the top layer, you know, the, the, the 20 meg or the 50 meg that has been put on top of the server core image in the latest release. So it will just pull down that little tiny bit. I'll rebuild my whole container image using the latest version of Windows, which has got that hotfix in. I'll kill whatever containers are running on the old version and, and run new ones. Or I'll use, if I'm in swarm mode, I can, Docker can do that for me. It, it can do a rolling upgrade for me. Um, so, so you get that, that OS patching stuff that, you know, it, it just becomes uh, trivial. Understood. And um, I guess we have time for one more. I know it's right on the hour, but um, we got a question around licensing from John. John, I'm guessing this is around Docker Data Center. Um, in that case, licensing is around uh, it's price per engine, right? So you think about it, it's engine per um, per node, which is basically um, any host with an engine installed on it per year, and we can you know share that pricing with you if you like as well. Um, but I do want to be conscious of everyone's time here. I see that there were a few questions that have come in. What we can do is follow up with everyone here. Um, typically, we do like a follow-up blog where we include um, some of these questions and uh, we provide answers from Mike and Elton. So we'll most likely do that as well. I want to thank everyone in the audience for being here. Um, 
and learning about what we're doing and the work we're doing around um, Docker and Microsoft and, and Windows. And um, I want to thank Mike and Elton for being here and taking everyone through your presentation. Yeah, thanks for listening. No problem. Thanks for joining me, guys. I appreciate it. And like I said, this has been recorded, and we'll be in touch. We'll be sending out a, an email to everyone later this week with the recording. All right. Thank you all, and happy holidays.